So a brochure is just a, a static website. A brochure has a few different elements. It's an overview explaining the product on a page and giving you the overview as a customer as to what this is going to do for you. And then it's the specifications that tells you what's included. We've created is a piece of technology that creates a steady stream of beautiful data rich leads that just keep coming in and coming in because customers love filling in quizzes. They love interacting with nice, pretty landing pages, filling in questions and getting reports that tell them something that's important about their world. I love businesses where once it hits a certain point, the revenues can scale exponentially and the costs go up incrementally. That's the big difference. All right, Daniel, let's kick off, sir. So a man that has built and sold many different companies, some of a value of greater than 10 million plus, which is already staggering. I'm pretty sure the percentage of people that build a 10 million plus business is 1.4%. So because you've done that multiple times, you multiply those out. So the percentage of you being in that bracket is ridiculous. <laughs> but out of everything you've done, how come you wrote a book on influence? Well, the first 10 years of my career, I was working with really influential people on the stage. So we were running events all over Australia and then in the UK. And a lot of the people who we would put on stage were best-selling authors, celebrity entrepreneurs, um, actual celebrities. Um, and I spent a lot of time with these people. And I was especially behind the scenes and like, you know, just kind of hanging out at the hotels and going from place to place and traveling on airplanes and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that they all had a very similar business model. Like all of them did the same stuff and there was a lot of familiar things that they were working on. Um, and around 2008, there was the Obama election and his campaign was all run on social media or it was very focused on social media. He was on Twitter and he was on YouTube and he was on Facebook and all this sort of stuff. And it was a tipping point for social media. And it was like, for me, this spark went off in my head where I went, oh my goodness, the last 10 years I've spent mm -hmm. looking at people who value their personal brand and who monetize it and turn it, turn it into a business. And then this social media thing allows everyone to do this. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of like put two and two together and I thought this is going to be the business model everyone wants to do. Like everyone's going to want to do this this type of business model. Um, so for me to kind of almost clarify things on my own, I, when I write, I write because I want to clarify something in my own head. I find it to be an experience, like the writing experience, I get more out of it than anyone else could possibly <laughs> get out of it because I'm having a, I'm having to think, I'm having a process. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, I put a book out and I didn't know it would do very well. I, I just kind of, you know, was happy to put it out, key person of influence. Um, and it just hit, mm. it hit hard. I was about 28, 29 when I put it out. And, um, and suddenly, you know, 100,000 copies go out. So uh, it was, you know, it was pr pretty wild. Yeah, it's pretty crazy because you see those people, like I always mention, see Hormozzi mentioned that about the Kardashians was that, you know, he was breaking his head against the wall like banging his head off the wall for years right and he got his business to like i think it was like a million a, year, a month about 1.5 and then he looked at kylie jenner then who basically did like a billion overnight right just straight overnight we saw what ryan reynolds and all this but it's a fact that key person of influence was like 2016 2017 but now no 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 i wrote that book in 2009 and it came out to the early 2010 oh no way it was even the you the the revised edition came out in in the mid to uh, like 2015 and the the original came came out in 2010 so so taking that as an example so you, I'm the, you're the original I'm, I'm the <laughs> i'm the original i'm the og you're you're the original <laughs> original but now it's even gotten like 10 times more significant whereby like uh, businesses are just totally. only built on social media brands like that it's like totally, yeah. it's like the the lone wolf entrepreneur is like almost like it's like looked down on because it's like it's like why would you put yourself through the struggle when you can build a brand leverage a brand publish a book publish an order bring this all together yeah. uh, connect to people and interconnect to people versus being on your own so like do you feel do you find like the entrepreneurs that come into your circle in through the accelerator and whatever are re reluctant to do this and why do you think that is yeah, there are some people who are reluctant. Normally by the time they get to me, they're not reluctant um, because otherwise they wouldn't have made it <laughs> made it in front of me in the, in the end. 
when I first published the book, it was very much early and there were very few examples of it working and people kind of looked at Richard Branson as an example. And, um, you yeah, know, there were a few few examples where this was a, a clearly a thing. Um, but today everyone can see it working. They see it over and over. Here's the problem. The problem is when you enter any business space, because of the digital environment, you're in competition with everyone in the world. So suddenly it's an incredibly noisy market. No matter what it is you want to do, even if you want to do it locally, people are still bombarded with messages globally mm. from people all over the world. So there's this massive amount of noise. Now, if you've got a big established business with billions of revenue, you just simply pay money to cut through the noise. You just sponsor the football or you sponsor you know, something to try and cut through the noise and it costs you a fortune. If you're a small business, how are you going to get the cut through? So really the biggest secret weapon that all small businesses have is the voice of the founder. Mm -hmm. The founder is the person who has a story. The founder quit their job to go and start this thing. People want to know, why did you do that? What, what, what was it you saw? Mm -hmm. um, so we have this little secret weapon, this one thing that we have that's unique to us as a small business, which is the ability to use our personal brand as a way to draw attention to our business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a founder, it's very easy to get up on a stage and talk about what it is you do. If you're a corporate, uh, like if I ring up, if I ring up right now and try and talk to PwC and say, "Can I please book one of the senior partners to come and speak at a conference?" They're going to have like six months worth of meetings to figure out who that partner is and what they're going to say and all this sort of stuff, right? Yeah. You've you've worked in corporate, yeah, hundred hundred. So it's going to be very exactly. So. Um, Whereas if I ring a small business and say, can I get the founder to come and speak at our conference? It's like, yep, we'll be there next week. Yeah. Um, and and that is what, you know, that's that's a superpower. So we've got to leverage that superpower. We've got to make the most of that superpower. 100%. Um, and it, if you can do it really well, you can have multiple businesses and you can, um, you can also live the dream now, right? So you can live and work from anywhere in the world. You can do business with anywhere in the world. Uh, you can launch products. You can launch something new every year. You can develop and, and create something of, of interest and then put it out there. You can create a book that also marries up with a business opportunity. So, you know, you can you can have, let's say, 10,000 very loyal fans and those 10,000 people can actually give you, really, you can serve them and they can effectively make your life an amazing life from any wherever you are in the world. And you could be completely unheard of in most circles, mm -hmm. but within your 10,000 person little group, your, you know, people respect you for what you what you talk about, um, you know, and that's the times that we live in. We're living in the most incredible time. It it is just the most amazing time. You couldn't have done this at any other time in history. And I want to get into the different product suite and how you built out different companies and stuff later because there's different aspects of that, right? But to show how relevant that is, I'm doing a, a presentation tomorrow about like long form content, uh, the power of influence through long form content was what the title of it was, and one of the slides is how when I started my show, I only had like a hundred true fans and it was enough to have a, to make a salary off it. Year two, I was able to get to a thousand, so not 10,000. Year two, I was able to get a, a thousand and I could make more than my old banking salary. And year three was where it kind of all kind of came together, right? But it's a combination of like that audience, building an authority, building trust with people, and then being able to not leverage it, but almost tap into it then when the time comes right, because you have the right products and everything in place, right? But focusing in on the on the pitch area, because I think that's very interesting. So uh, within um, KPIs, so key, key person of influence, you have the pitch, you have published, you have product, and so on and so forth. But the pitch, I find that a lot of people struggle with, even if they are the founder, because it's kind of like, have you ever noticed that Americans are way easier to, to discuss their ideas, much more open than the Irish people or the UK people or like Aussies. They find it very difficult to put that story together. And I definitely struggle with that. I definitely found it difficult to be like, oh, like this is what I've done and this is, this is why it's effective and this is why you should buy into it. So for someone who's at that kind of early stage approach, how do you, how do you interweave that story into their pitch? Well, the first thing is that Americans don't have it that much easier than, than um, anyone else. The ones that you hear about are the ones that have made it to the top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's 330 million 
Americans who all want to live the American dream. And there's a few dozen of them who get such cut through that we hear about them all over the world. Um, and because we hear about them, they're the ones who are the best pitchers. They're the ones who have the best stories and all of that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so here's how we do it. The first thing you've got to acknowledge is that you have to acknowledge that your story is boring to you, but might be interesting to somebody else. And I don't care who you are, even if you've, even if you've won an Olympic medal or if you've, um, you know, done some incredible, you know, innovation, your story is going to be boring to you because you're so close to it. So you're going to suffer with something called proximity bias. Mm. Proximity bias is that we just get so used to the things that are around uh, and, and close to us. So, for example, my father-in-law, he has a 1969 Rolex Submariner that he's worn every single day since 1969 when he bought it. For me personally, I find it to be a really incredible watch because it's a vintage Rolex with the box, with the papers, and I know that it's worth about 30000 Um, But when he looks at it, it's just his boring old watch that he's had for decades. So it's funny. He thinks of it as, a, as an old $300 watch. I think of it as an incredible $30,000 watch. Mm. Um, now, <laughs> this is called proximity bias, that we just get so um bored with the things that we're very close to so what we have to do is we have to um start to look at uh, almost more objectively and in a low resolution view what is it that we've done that could be valuable to others what's interesting about our story and maybe we need to work with a coach who doesn't know us so well so that th those elements can come out mm -hmm. i like to tease it into three parts i like to tease it into your origin story your vision and your mission so that's past, present, and future, right? So the origin story is your past. What are the interesting things about your past? Your vision is what's interesting about the future that you wanna see happen. What is it you're trying to make happen in the world? And your mission is what are the very valuable things that you know how to do right now today? So essentially, we wanna tease apart what's valuable in the past, the present, and the future, and we wanna sort of get a low resolution view of those things. Um, and low resolution just means that we can describe it in one or two sentences. Okay. Um, and the, one of the challenges that everyone faces is that their own story is high resolution, right? I've, I've lived every single day of my life, so it's hard for me to see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. Whereas you might look at my life and see, oh, you did this interesting thing 10 years ago and then five years ago and then three years ago. So for you, you have this lovely low resolution view of me mm. and you can probably spot things that are valuable about me that I can't spot about myself because I'm too close to my own story. Yeah. So that's the challenge. And the goal is to be able to work with someone, a friend or someone who knows us not so well, a coach perhaps, to get that low resolution past, present and future statement um, that we can then craft into a pitch. Mm. All right, people, we're just gonna take one short little break for a little update about Podcast University. So if you enjoy podcasts like this and you wanna start your own podcast, head down to the links down below to Podcast University. This is a learning platform that I've built to help people like you build, launch, and scale your own podcast. I wasted many years doing this, making it all up as, a lot, as I go. So I put everything together in a very seamless and, and easy to follow course for you guys to follow and just learn exactly how to do it. So if you wanna bypass a lot of the mess with your podcast, Check out the links down below to Podcast University and it will show you exactly how to launch and scale your own podcast. And the challenge with this is the fact that people don't understand the value of it, right? And I love how you reference in your book saying that, you know, it could be raising capital, it could be getting a partner, it could be just a potential client or a customer or someone to give you an introduction. So you don't realize the severity of how important this is. And I definitely fell victim to this. I felt like that in the, even the beginning of my podcast, I've been very lucky with the guests that I've had from the very beginning and I felt like that knowing what I know now I could have told the story better or even just in a year's mm. time I can tell the story better and then where I'm right now so it's kind of like people think oh well I'll get I'll get to there it's kind of like the people that say they'll save when they have money right or they'll stop smoking when they feel feel better it's just like you're yeah. never actually truly going to be there right so a big part of my audience is the people going from like zero to one zero to 10k trying to get to their their first business how do you tell the story without having um, the experience? Well, let's say you don't have any experience. You need to get someone on your team. Um, and your value is that you're young, energized, unencumbered, 
see a lot of the time young people for example they don't recognize their own value um when you're when you're young with no kids um you have an amazing amount of energy you have no overheads and you have no encumbrances so that is three superpowers now when an older guy like me looks at you and I go, man, oh man, you know, when you choose, you just pick up and go to Bali and hang out in Bali. <laughs> I remember what it was like to be able to do that. Um, now I've got three little kids yeah. uh, in school and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I got, you know, I got parents of a certain age and I got, you know, all this stuff that I've got roots down. I look at you as having a superpower and I go, wow, this guy can travel around the world, go where he wants, pick up suitcase, live out of a suitcase, study new trends. He can zig and zag much faster than I can. Mm. So when I when I look at you, I'm seeing that superpower. When you look at me, you're sitting there going, this guy's established, mm. he's got money, he's got connections, he's got lots of experiences under his belt. So you're looking at me and easily seeing that I'm standing on a mountain of value. I'm looking at you and easily seeing that you're standing on a mountain of value. And we can't look down and see our own mountain of value that's underneath our feet. Mm. So the first thing is, is like, you've got to stop looking at other people and start looking at what is your own mountain of value. The, the other thing about pitching is this sets the whole direction of where you're going to go, right? So for example, the other day I was at a networking function. There were 200 people. This young guy comes up to me. And he says, hey, I'm really struggling, right? And he's like about 28, 29. I'm really struggling. I said, what's going on? He goes, oh, I'm a copywriter. But ever since ChatGPT came out, um, you know, people are just saying to me all the time that I'm doing the wrong thing because, you know, there's AI and, um, and I'm, I'm doing all of that. And I said, here's what I want you to try. I want you to, there's 200 people here. Go and introduce yourself to seven or eight people. And instead of saying you're a copywriter, say that you work with entrepreneurs to create copy that leads to fast growth and tell them that you use AI and experienced copywriting techniques blended together mm. to, to, create, to create content that creates fast growth for, for small businesses. And when they ask about that, talk about the fact that inside your package that you offer, what you do is everything from the first touch points that people might see on social media, right through to reading a, a, a detailed Q&A document before purchasing an, or, or an onboarding document after they've purchased to make sure that they're online. And that basically say that a combination of AI, your experience and passion, and the business owner for direction creates a breakthrough in all of this content. So he's like, oh, okay, wow. So just, you know, just embrace, embrace this thing. So he goes out and he goes and he introduces himself to seven or eight people. He comes swinging back to me. He's like, four people want to have a meeting with me next week. <laughs> he's like. <laughs> Man. So a slight, slight change, a slight tweak to the way that he pitches himself. And he goes from people telling him to rack off, uh, to can we meet up next week? Can we discuss what you do? I really want to talk about the packages that you offer. Um, so this is the power of the pitch. It's literally reframing. And we mentioned Crystal, who you were on the show recently, but he says this quite similar too, in terms of like, if you look at an image, if you look at an image on a wall and it looks shit, looks fine, whatever, it's like $20, you got it from Amazon. But if you put a nice frame around it, and then you put some of those art gallery lights on it, and then you put it in a nice room, and you put on some nice music, it's suddenly worth five hundred thousand dollars because we reframe how <laughs> how we view it. And when I when he said that to me, my it's just a penny drop. It's just like it's all perspective, right? And I I often say this to people. Well, oh, framing framing is framing is everything. It's yeah. everything, right? And I often say as well, like you know you have to be the first customer and to some degree in terms of like you want to be able to buy it from you because you're like this is so valuable so instead of saying i'm a copywriter all the bells and whistles that you added it's like that makes me excited about my own product because i know i can get there and it also sets an expectation right because the big thing that we do is like we grow uh, company podcasts now that means the numbers have to go up every month and we put all these bells and whistles on guarantees and all this kind of stuff so the standard is set pretty fucking high right and therefore, we have to deliver on that thing. But if I just said, we just create podcasts, it's boring. So I think that that's where a lot of these agencies or, or products, I guess, it's, it's would you find it less common to have this issue in general products or SaaS products versus agencies and media companies? 
How do you find that? Because you're a product dude as well. No, no. I, yes, I am. Um, it's the same problem. So the, the first problem is, and SaaS companies have this problem and agencies have this problem. The first problem is you have to have radical empathy with your customer mm -hmm. and you have to understand what is the customer trying to get done? What do they want to have happen? And you've got to start thinking about, you've got to think through the lens of my customer is caught in a wrestling match and they feel like they're constantly battling and struggling with something. They desperately want to achieve a particular outcome, but nothing seems to work. Every time they go and try and get this outcome, they bang their toe into something painful. They get a paper cut, right, metaphorically. Um, they get a blood nose trying to get this outcome. They've almost given up on it. They, they wish it would happen, but they've almost gotten to the point where they think maybe it's just a, a dream and I, I'll give up on it. They've got emotions flooding, right? They've got hope for achieving the outcome and they've got despair for the fact that it doesn't seem to happen. Mm. Now, if you start with that level of empathy and then you come in and say, all right, how do I build my offering and my pitch to match up with that reality that's going through their head? Then you end up with something that gets cut through. Now, if you've got a SaaS product, you can easily screw this up. You can say, uh, I have a SaaS product that does landing pages and data analytics, and it does um, questionnaires and surveys and then dynamic reporting, right? So take ScoreApp, one of my businesses. Mm -hmm. So we could describe it. I could say, what does ScoreApp do? ScoreApp does uh, optimized landing pages followed by questionnaires followed by dynamic reports, and it's all in one thing. Right. And you go, oh, okay. Like, fair enough. That's a piece of software, whatever. Now, if I, if I said instead that almost all small businesses struggle with lead generation, lead generation is one of the very most important things that sets how much money you're going to make from your business. If you have, uh, if you're amazing at doing something and you're really, really good at it, but you fail to generate leads for that, then it's game over. You don't have a business. And if you're generating hundreds of leads, but the product or service needs work, you've, that's fine. You can actually find someone to do that. So everything's downstream from lead generation. And the people who are making the most money in all industries are good at generating leads. And the people who are struggling in all industries, it doesn't matter if they're good at they, what they do, they are um, terrible at generating leads. And what we've created is a piece of technology that creates a steady stream of beautiful data rich leads that just keep coming in and coming in because customers love filling in quizzes. They love interacting with nice, pretty landing pages, filling in questions and getting reports that tell them something that's important about their work. Mm. So if I start talking about what this, what outcome this achieves, then my market responds. If I start talking about, you know, the inputs, mm -hmm. right? Then, then you know it's not it's not the same. Imagine going to a Porsche 911 dealership, and they just say and they say, hey, you know, a Porsche 911 has two and a half thousand suppliers. Let me walk through all the different parts. Um, let me talk to you about the shock absorbers, and let me talk to you about the the tires. And you kind of like you kind of just wanted a sexy car that makes you look cool. And all they had to do was say, this is a really sexy car that makes you look cool. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is your boyhood dream. Let's get you behind the wheel and see how you feel, mm -hmm. right? So the point is, is that most small businesses, whether they're SaaS businesses or agencies, they're just talking about how that looks to them. Mm -hmm. They're talking about how they experience their product or service. They're not talking about how the customer experiences the product or service. And I love that because you're aggregating everything together. That's what I love is the fact that you're able to focus on the outcomes as a, as a true like marketer really sell the outcomes and the benefits, whereas most people are too caught up on the inputs. And this is where it's funny because like, you know, background in tech, I see a lot of CTOs that are founders have this challenge, right? They're coming up to their problems and they're saying like, this is all the API calls and all, and all this stuff, but no one gives a shit about the API calls unless it solves their problem, right? I wanted to ask yes. you, um, going into deeper on the product side of things, about productized services. Um, especially amongst the kind of like either solo founder or a small team recently, the services that have those kind of productized elements grow really significantly. We do something quite similar. It's a bit more bespoke, I will say that, but to the same point, how can you increase the value 
of your service having influence and being someone of influence. All right, guys, one short little update for Voex. I want to give a short little overview about my own company, my media company called Voex. So if you are a company or you are an enterprise looking to grow your brand and looking to grow your podcast, feel free to reach out to work with us at Voex. What we do is a fully fledged end-to-end -end management of your podcast. We take care of the strategy, the consulting. We take care of the growth, the management. We take care of all the editing, all the boring stuff so you can focus on creating good podcasts and create and growing your brand. If you want to grow your podcast and get to new users, if you want to grow your business, generate more revenue and all that good stuff, check out the links down below to Voex. You can follow through to schedule a call with our team or else you can fill out the application form to see if you qualify to work with us. Thank you. Let, let, let's talk about well let's talk about two things you've raised there first of all let's talk about productized services so productizing a service a couple of things to kick the process off you give it a name all right give the give the give it a name because products have names so for example um that guitar behind me is a fender stratocaster mm -hmm. right so it's made by fender and the word stratocaster is stratosphere and sending something broadcasting something to the stratosphere so you get a sense that a fender stratocaster is the kind of guitar that's going to broadcast something into the stratosphere right and it is a iconic product there's a porsche 911 uh, there is an apple ipod or an iphone or a ipad it's not a tablet pc it's an ipad um, so when we think about iconic uh, products, the product starts by actually having a name. It's got a name. You've named it. Um, so it's not like a business coaching package. Mm -hmm. It is the, it, it might be the dynamic growth package. So it's got a, you, we want to start with a name. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we want to do with it, with it is we want to package up elements. There's going to be core elements that your business is world-class at. And then there's going to be the, um, the frills which are all the things that come with it that your business brings in from others. So if I'm running a pizza restaurant, I am not having to make the wine. I'm not having to make the salami. I'm not having to make the cheese. I'm not having to do all of those things. What I am doing is I'm putting all the ingredients on the pizza, putting it in my uh, oven, cooking it my way using my uh, wood-fired oven, and then I'm serving it up really hot in front of the customer mm. and pouring them a glass of wine that I selected from the vineyard that I know is a great vineyard. Um, now, most of the ingredients are brought in from other suppliers, but I've brought them together. I've put it on the menu and I'm serving it up to the customer and making sure that they get the thing that they imagined. Um, now, it, what most here's what most service businesses do. Most service businesses go, oh, the customer wants a glass of wine. Well, we don't have a vineyard, so how could I possibly give them any wine? So I just won't serve wine because, you know, I don't own a vineyard. And then they go, oh, if you want wine, you go down the road and get the wine from like the shop that does wine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why are you doing that to your customers? Like give the customer what they bloody want. Mm -hmm. You know, if the customer wants the fast growth package and it includes content, copywriting, branding, design, web development, SEO, uh, Facebook ads, Google ads, if it includes all that stuff, package it all up. Mm -hmm. All right, so give it a name, package it up, and then the, then the third element, and this will blow people's minds, especially if they're under 35, is create a brochure for it, right? It could be a digital <laughs> brochure that people download, right? Uh, create a brochure. I wouldn't know much about that. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is a brochure? So a brochure is just a, it's like a, a static website that is on a page mm -hmm. and it explains what it is you're getting. So. Here's what you want to do. When you get a chance, you go into a BMW dealership and ask for the brochure or download the brochure off the website for the for the four series. Um, when you, you know, when you're thinking about um, you know, buying a particular new MacBook, download the spec sheet, download the actual, have a look at the brochure page for the MacBook, right? So Apple obviously do a brochure page. Their website is a series of brochures. They've got a brochure for the iPhone and a brochure for the iPad and a brochure for the MacBook. So essentially, a brochure has a few different elements. It's an, it's an overview explaining the product on a page and giving you the overview as a customer as to what this is going to do for you. And then it's the specifications. Mm -hmm. It tells you what's included with your pricing and your guarantees and all of that. So put it all in one place. So even if you're, a, let's say you're a business coach, 
right? Or, or let's say you do uh, podcasts. So rather than saying, oh, I do podcast production, right? And you know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you mean, but you know what you're talking mm. about. It's like, I do podcast production. Let me send you through the brochure for that. And I get a PDF on my email and it says, um, high growth podcast production, right? And, and it's beautifully designed and it says, a lot of businesses are now growing with digital assets like podcasts and they want to have a series of episodes that communicate their value in an entertaining and engaging way to their customers. We do those podcasts where the experts in it, we've won these awards, we've got these networks, we've got these best practices, we bring in suppliers, we help you pick the right equipment, we do all of this sort of stuff, right? Here's the specifications of what's included, boom, 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 boom. In addition to that, as a as an added benefit, we send you these books about podcasting. Mm. We have uh, an online portal that has some um, media training for anyone who's going to be on a podcast. We do some um, practice runs with our uh, with our team to just get you comfortable with podcasting. Boom, 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 boom. It's all included, and here's the price, and here's the guarantee. Mm. And it's like now, as soon as you've given it a name, packaged up all the ingredients, and stuck it in in a document that looks like a product, now you've got a productized service. That's it, right? So it hasn't been that hard. You've just, you know, you've gone through a few steps that most people don't do, mm -hmm. and now you've got a productized service. So my mind is firing off about 400 different directions right now. So you've given me so much different ideas, right? And the reason why is because whenever I do, like, uh, I do frequent sales calls, like probably like a few a week or whatever, no matter where the conversation ends, it always leads with like, send me the details in an email. So like we just have like a static email that goes out, but it's obviously an email, not a sexy version. Whereas I actually have a full-time designer who does like some of her slide decks and whatnot. So it's basically like I could get this done and have this and so could anybody else, right? And everybody yeah, else could get to and this it, point as well. It's just, you, you, it increases the value, right? It's funny too. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. If it was, let's say it was currently 8,900 for the package, and then you put it on a beautifully designed um, PDF and you repriced it at 9,900, an extra thousand. For some strange reason, it will feel to the customer better value at 9,900 if it's presented in a beautiful design PDF than, an, than the 8,900 as an email where you're recapping what it is that you do. 8,900 on email, boom, 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 will actually just mm. feel like, oh, okay, uh, they've cobbled it all together. It's, it feels expensive. Nine thousand nine hundred. When it on that document, it's got some case studies, some testimonials, some some awards, all of this stuff. You know, it's like, oh, actually, this. I feel like I get a lot for for ten grand here. So you'll you'll get a better conversion at a higher price. And the small nuances around the offer get value a bit more. I often found that or when I'm speaking to other kind of entrepreneurs that they find that like the other management admin stuff isn't valued as much in their offer. Therefore, when they ask for 5,000 or 6,000, like we increased our prices and got a lot of pushback from like new potential customers saying, oh, like, I, like we could find it somewhere cheaper or elsewhere. But we're not trying to compete on price. We're trying to compete on quality. So it's like difficult to sell the transformation without having that database of like records now we do have a lot of testimonials and reviews and stuff but it's kind of like they have to go fishing so i need to be able to bring it together that's how it would be much more effective bring it bring it together bring it together and keep refocusing on their outcome not the ingredients right so if you go to mm. i mean Im imagine i went to a michelin starred restaurant and I said, hey, I've just had a look at all the ingredients that you're putting into my meal. I could buy those ingredients from, from the local supermarket much cheaper. And they go, oh, wait a second, Daniel, our understanding is that you wanted to take your wife out for a romantic evening uh, and celebrate, mm. uh, you know, and that you want a magical special experience. That's what we're offering. We're not offering a set of ingredients. So if I'm talking about your podcast offer, I'm sitting there saying, look, my understanding is that you want a fast growth business and you want a really high impact uh, podcast that allows you to communicate to your customers value and in an entertaining and educational way. And you essentially want people to listen to the podcast and you want thousands of people listening to the podcast. I'd say this, I'd say, 
there are slight tweaks to what you can do to a podcast that change it from being an average of four to six minutes worth of listen time to 40 to 60 minutes worth of listening time. Um, and that's what you're paying us for. You're paying for an educational and entertaining podcast that people actually listen to. Mm. That's the difference, right? That's going from amateur to pro. That's the idea, right? Um, I wanted to ask you about scaling. So the thing with I've observed from you, you know, you've had your events business, you've had um, software business, you've had a few other businesses. When I hear you speak on other podcasts, you're always looking for things that are scalable. So like not a restaurant, not something that's like literally dependent on too much resources or, or labor or in a certain position. How do you look at what you want to scale? Like what type of businesses are you trying to identify that? Okay, this does have good value. It is in something that an industry that's moving forward and that we couldn't scale in the future. I'm not worried about labor costs. I'm not worried about costs. I'm worried about do the costs scale in lockstep with the revenue? That's the big issue that I'm worried about. Do mm -hmm. the costs stay, scale in lockstep? So what does that mean? Well, I don't mind having a business that has a million a month of overhead, but if a million a month of overhead is required mm -hmm. to do 2 million of revenue and then 2 million is required to do the next million of revenue, right? If, if I'm essentially building a business that it never takes off that's what that's what worries me um, i love businesses where once it hits a certain point the revenues can scale exponentially and the costs go up incrementally and that's that's the big difference mm. does that make sense uh, i want to ask you on that so you're saying pr pr proportionately so software is a perfect example right so you know, it costs you like 200K to build like a really good engaging app or whatever it is. And then from there, your, your, your costs are somewhat proportionate. But in a service business, it's difficult to scale labor. However, if you have someone on like a full-time salary, obviously they can produce more and then you can service more clients. So how would you think about scaling service businesses in that instance? So the first thing I'm looking for is I'm looking for the things that scale the easiest. So here's, here's what scales easier than anything else. The first one is called intellectual property. Intellectual property is value that is created through your methodologies. It's value that's created through things that you know. It's through your knowledge, through your reputation. Um, so intellectual property is something that essentially is highly scalable uh, at mm. no additional cost. The next thing is media assets. So media assets, digital media assets, they are infinitely scalable. A million people or a billion people can um, watch them uh, and they lose no quality and they cost nothing extra to send out to a million or a billion people. Uh, so media assets are the second one. And then the third one uh, is software, right? So you mentioned software, anything that is software. Now, even in a service business, you can bring software in. You can have client onboarding portals. You can have um uh, scorecards quizzes dashboards that are automated and that is essentially a form of software um, and then the final one is finance so finance scales uh it's um essentially raising a million or raising 10 million is roughly the same amount of process mm -hmm. so um anything that's intellectual property media software or finance is highly scalable so if you can figure out can this business be driven up with any of those four things? Then I don't mind if it's got labor component, provided the labor labor has those components wrapped around it. Mm, because if you think about it, labor is not directly proportionate to how much revenue you're bringing in, right? So because potentially you could get a better rep reputation, so a key person of influence, sign bigger retainers, longer deal cycles, having implementing code to scale as well and incorporating that in the team. And I did a little feedback report from my audience before this podcast, just saying that like any advice from people, from someone who's built multi-million dollar companies. And one of the questions was, how do you scale a team? And do you use platforms like AI to have this, right? So if it is a service business or if it's, if it's even um, any other type of business to actually improve the team capacity and what you can, what you can um, produce. Yeah, so that all fits under a banner called productivity. So productivity is the level of output 
mm-hmm. per person, mm-hmm. right? So for every person on the team, how much output do they have? Now, most people think that productivity is a factor of working hard, being focused, optimizing your time, you know, doing a course on um, productivity, uh, having your to-do lists and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> None of that stuff really makes a difference with productivity. What makes the biggest difference with productivity is um, what's called assets. So the underlying assets is what drives productivity. So if I give you an example, um, if I have two people whose job is to chop down trees, one of them is six foot six with a an axe and they're massive and they're hugely strong. And the other one is a 16 year old teenager with a chainsaw. Uh, the, I would say the chainsaw, the, the kid with the chainsaw is probably going to chop down more trees in a week than the person who's got the big arms and the axe because the underlying asset is doing most of the work. Mm. So for example, if a restaurant has a Michelin star, that Michelin star is doing most of the work at setting the price um, for the restaurant and getting the bookings to come in. Mm. Um, if, um, uh, if a consulting firm has a founder who has a best-selling book on the business charts, it's the best-selling book that is doing the majority of the work of that consulting firm winning clients and having a steady stream of inbound opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, If two real estate agents are out there selling real estate and one of them's in Mayfair in London and the other one is in Blackpool uh, up up north, um, it's going to be very easy for one of them in Mayfair to make 5 million to 10 million worth of sales and it's going to be extremely hard for the other one in Blackpool to make 5 to 10 million worth of sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the underlying, it's not their sales skills or their, or their time optimization. It's the fact that they are working in a much working with much more high quality assets. Mm. So essentially the thing that is making the biggest difference is the high quality assets. So here's what you do in answer to your question, you build a team of between three and 10 people and you measure revenue per person. So for example, if you've got five people and you do 500,000 of revenue, you've now got 100,000 per person. And then you take the team up a little bit to maybe eight or nine people and you see if you can maintain the same or better revenue per person. So you get to eight people, you got 800,000. Okay, great. We're still at 100,000 per person. And what you do is at around eight to 12 people, you do everything you can to jam as many assets into that business as you possibly can. So you ramp up the website, you ramp up the SEO, you write a book about it, you get a podcast about it. Uh, you win an award for it. So you just start ramming assets into that business without adding any headcount. And what you're looking for is you're looking for the revenue per person to go up. So with eight people, we do 900 grand. With eight people, we do a million, mm. right? It's like, aha, now we've, got, now we've got rising revenue per person. Then you add three or four more people in and you see if you can maintain the high revenue per person. Can we actually ramp up revenue per person by bringing on another three or four people can we can we maintain this high revenue per person once you've got all of those assets doing most of the work and you can add people and maintain the higher revenue per person you can scale the team Hmm. Um, with that said it's very easy the first three people on a team is what i would call the co-founding team right so that is a small nimble dynamic little team designed to kick something off the three to twelve person business is the is the boutique that is the self-organizing rebels and misfits making things happen. 35, 40 people is a professionalized business that's now scalable and valuable. There's this gap between about 12 people and 35 people that is a very dangerous time in the business journey. And that is where you're too big to be small, but too small to be big. And you really, most businesses really struggle. It's a big, thick wall that needs to be dealt with. Um, and it kills most businesses. So most businesses do just fine between the three and 12 space. They do fine from 35 to 150 people, but it's that 12 to 35 person team, uh, too big to be small, too small to be big. And that is going to be the killer for most of you. Why is that? Well, because you need leaders and managers, but you can't afford leaders and managers um, because uh, you want to be a self-organizing little team that just made things happen without too many, uh, too many uh, you know, processes in place. 
but you just doesn't work past 12 people. Um, so by the time you get to 15, 16, 17 people, you've split into three little teams of teams. You're no longer coordinating yourselves. You're no longer fluidly just making stuff happen. You know, you're, you're almost like a, a factory that's producing three different things that need to come together at the same time, but they just don't come together at the same time. Mm. Um, so you're just in this weird dynamic where if you hire a leadership team, you can't afford them and it puts the business under too much pressure. If you don't hire a leadership team, you need them and the business isn't coordinating itself. Mm -hmm. So essentially you need to be more grown up, but you can't afford to be more grown up. So it's a really difficult time. That's super interesting. I, I love the idea about squeezing out the different elements, like improving the assets and trying to get that done. Cause we're at five now, five full time. Um, and you know, definitely not doing a hundred thousand per, per individual, but I see partnerships and I see code being much more effective than just hiring, right? Just like hiring for the sake of hiring and getting into that dreaded 13 zone for, for no particular reason, right? Because like, that's what was like told to you that you should do, right? Like hire more people. But it's funny that you say this because like we have like some of our editors will use some AI platforms. I don't give a shit what they use as long as the, the work is really good, right? And then some of our writers will use different AI platforms so that they can integrate the work. And as a result, we can produce 50 podcasts a month if we need to. That's that's the that's the beauty of it, mm. right? So it's about using the tools with what's within our resources. And there's so many different places to go from this. And my mind is... Con okay, let me, go ahead. let me just quickly cut in there. There's a difference between tools and assets. Okay. A tool is something that Tool is something that anyone has access to. Anyone can find the tool. Anyone can use the tool. An asset is something that I have to come to you for that, mm. right? I have to come and get that from you. So, for example, a, a Michelin star, I can only go to a restaurant that has a Michelin star to, go, to get the Michelin star restaurant experience. Um, however, a tool like a frying pan or uh, a, a cool, an oven um, any restaurant can buy those and any restaurant can use those. They're freely available to any restaurant. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by assets is things that I can only get from your business. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'll give you, I'll give you a list of really great ones. Things like winning awards, major, major asset. If I want to work with an award winning, um, podcast studio, then there's the awards. Um, things like a book that you've written on podcasting or some amazing uh, podcasts that explain the podcasting process or videos um, that help me to get on board with my whole team and, and give me that whole thing. A special unique strategy document that is unique to you. So if you created, you know, the pod 360 method um, and it's like, if I want the pod 360 method, I have to come to you for that pod 360 method. Mm -hmm. The, that would be, uh, something that becomes unique to proprietary to your business. Um, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to go through, uh, if I want to, if I want to get a start with why consultant, I have to go through Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. I can get business consultants. I can get someone who helps me with my purpose, but I can't get a start with why consultant mm -hmm. because start with why is Simon Sinek's. You get what I mean? hundred uh, percent. And I really appreciate these yeah. examples because like, I feel like this is like a, a consulting session for me. So I really appreciate this. And I know, uh, <laughs> I know it doesn't come cheap at the best of times. My, my mind is constantly moving between here. There's so many different directions to take this, but you keep bringing up, you know, books and publishing. And I want to ask you a question on that is, so a big part of um, KPI is publishing a book. Now in 2023, would you still favor a book over over other means of communication and building leverage? A book is a very iconic document. Um, a book, for the last 500 years, a book has been a general purpose technology that everyone tends to respect and admire and understand. And anyone who went through the schooling system has been taught to respect a book, uh, to understand what a book's purpose is, and to kind of view a book as a um, meaningful document um, and to view an author as someone who has authority in a space. Mm -hmm. So in the next 10 years, that's probably not going to change, that the standalone iconic value of having a book will still count for something. It's easier than ever to write a book, so that's very handy. 
here's the tweak to the strategy. The tweak to the strategy is that you need to be very particular about the kind of book that you write because the only way to make a book work for 99% of authors is to give away a thousand copies per year. So the purpose of the book is that you're going to give them away. Mm -hmm. So when someone goes on Amazon, they see that the book is available for 12 pounds, but then they get a free one in their, in their, uh, sent to their office, or they get a free one given to them at an event, um, or they meet you and they get a free copy of the book. Your goal is to give away a thousand copies per year as gifts. Mm. And that is going to put you in a category of being generous, being an authority, uh, having a way of scaling your message. And when someone gives that gift to you, you're going to say, oh, thank you very much. That's very valuable. And we absolutely know never throw a book in the bin. No one goes home and throws a book in the bin. It's sacrilegious to throw books in the bin. So the book is going to sit around the office. It's going to be a physical thing that physically takes up space in my office. Um, and when I when when it comes time to to, to uh, buy from someone or to look for who's the authority, that physical document in my office is going to mean something. So <clears throat> when people say I'm writing a book and their intention is to sell copies, I always roll my eyes and I go, number one, very few people sell copies of their book. Number two, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and effort for an author to sell copies, right? You have to really convince someone to, to buy a copy of a book. Um, but anytime an author says, actually, I've figured out how to give away a book for free and make money off the back of that, I go, you've clocked it. That's, <laughs> that's the strategy. Yeah, 100%. That, that's how it works. That's the game. Ironically, the more books you give away for free, the more you'll sell. Yeah. So if you do give away a thousand copies a year, you'll end up selling a thousand copies a year as well, mm. but it doesn't matter. It's all about, it's all about giving away copies. You've got to give give away a thousand copies of the book every year. That's that's an insane process because like I've seen it happen, right? I've seen guys who tried to sell the books and I try, I see even close to my friends who were like, um, they were options traders at like Goldman Sachs and whatnot. And then they went on to write books, but what they do very intuitively and not this one in particular, I know another guy who has a sales uh, book, he gives the book away for free. It's like 99 cents, but then he has the exact same title in a course that's like 6,799. And then he has one-to-one -one coaching off that, which is like 20,000 a year. And it's just, yes, it's just yeah. used as a, it's top, top of funnel, right? So it's beyond the content, which is like disposable on LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever. It's like 99 cent, but it's second tier. And then it's going into the funnel. So it's like, it's set up beautifully. Like it's actually like a masterpiece when you think of like a really good funnel like that. And it just starts with the book, which yeah. is enough for it. You know, like I've read your books, they've been hugely influential on me as it is, uh, without having to do all the other stuff. So you, you give loads of value, you get loads of value and you feel like you want to give someone back that, that process too, right? Yeah. And as if by magic, the most incredible opportunities will emerge. So like, for example, I've had phone calls from massive corporates where they say, oh, someone passed us a copy of your book about personal branding. We want all of our partners to improve their personal brand. Um, will you speak at our partner conference? Uh, you know, it's, it's 20 minutes down the road. It's an hour on stage and we'll pay you, you know, a five figure sum. And it's like, great, fantastic. Uh, and then you deliver the talk and they say, oh, we actually want to kind of roll out a six month or a 12 month training. Could we bring you in to do some of that training? And it's a six figure budget. Mm. And, you know, that that's that's the goal. That's where all the money's made. Uh, even even SaaS business, right? So our software business is called Score App. And I wrote this book a year ago called Scorecard Marketing. And Scorecard Marketing is the four step playbook for getting better leads and bigger profits. And basically, I put together this little book. Now, the first thing I did, I printed 10,000 copies in, in the first month, right? So as soon as it was ready for print, we print 10,000 copies. And then I put someone on the phones whose job is to find every entrepreneur conference in the UK and say, can we send you uh, copies for your event, right, um, as a gift to go in the goodie bag? And they say, oh, um, we only do that for sponsors. 
we say, well, how much is sponsorship? Oh, it's uh, 500 pounds. Okay, great. Let's sponsor your event. And here's five, we'll send you the 500 pounds and you put one of those copies in every single bag as a gift. Great. Um, and then we just went through and we, we found lots of innovative ways. Uh, we ran out, we ran an ad campaign, but basically within three months, I'd given away 10,000 copies. What? I estimate that that has led to near on $200,000 a month worth of recurring revenue every single month. So 10,000 copies cost about two pounds 50 per copy. So there's about 25,000 pounds to print the 10,000 copies. It probably was another 25,000 to distribute them in, in the various ways that we did. So call it 50,000 pounds. And when, and, and I reckon it's, it's probably added up to about 200 grand a month of recurring revenue off the back of that. That is wild. You're only limited by your creativity, right? That's what it goes down to. It's not, there's no rules. Like there's no rules in this game. Like you could have just let them sit on Amazon, you know, fucking order on demand or whatever it is and no one would have touched it, but you're only limited by your own, uh, by your own creativity. How do you measure that impact and ROI? So, you know, you estimated that, right? But let's say someone who's like, yeah, well, yeah. So for us, you know, there are people who sign up using the link that's in the book. And then there are people who sign up and we send them a book, but they stick as in they don't churn because they had the book and the book told them exactly how to execute the strategy. They haven't, they haven't, the churn drops significantly on people that we sent a book to. So mm -hmm. there's a, there's a few different ways a book is going to help. It's going to help with initial signups. It's going to help with leads to conversions. It's going to help with uh, conversions to, you know, lifetime value. Um, so essentially I'm writing books that do those three things, you know, generate leads, convert leads and extend lifetime value. All of those things happen as a result of the book. Makes sense. It, it's like, there's lots of intangibles that come together and you obviously aggregate it in terms of like different traffic sources and things like this. I want to shift gears into the entrepreneurial journey. And I heard you say quite frequently, the entrepreneur's job is to be the organizing force, not to do the work. Now I definitely fell into that because I felt like I should work really hard and by working really hard, I'll make a lot of money. But luckily my team are a lot better than me at doing what I do. So what brought you to that realization or were you always like that? <laughs> uh, what brought me to that realization is not having any skills. Um, the biggest <laughs> strength that I have is that I, I don't have any, I don't have any strengths. <laughs> so, um, the, the greatest thing for me is because I'm a dropout and because I have no technical training on anything in particular, all I can really do is have an idea and ask people with technical skills to build it or do it. I can only enroll people. That's my only way of getting anything done. <laughs> So <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. Basic, basic. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But here's the thing: if I had a skill, I bet you I would. I bet you I'd try and leverage it. I bet I'd be. I bet I'd spend a ton of time trying to make that skill the thing that I do. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I, 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 I'm so grateful that I don't have any skills. I don't know how to do finance. Um, I don't know how to do accounting. I don't know how to do um anything technical i don't know how to do programming or design um you name it i don't know how to do it um here's what i do know how to do i know how to do sales right so i can sell stuff i'm good at sell uh selling um i know how to talk passionately about what i'm trying to achieve i know how to listen to customers and find out what they really want done um, the other good thing about not having any skills is I don't really know whether something's hard to achieve or not. Mm. So when a customer says, oh, I wish it had, you know, a double flanged widget attached, I sit there and go, oh, okay, well, I'll find out. Um, and if enough customers ask me for, you know, double flanged widgets, I'm going to sit there and go, well, I'm going to try and find someone who can build that and put that into the product. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's hard. Sometimes if you've got skills, you go, oh, that's really hard to do. And it's really difficult. And you talk the customers out of it mm. and, and you basically make them feel silly for, you know, for, for it. 
Um, whereas if you don't have any skills, you might just have an open mind and say, actually, uh, I think, I think we'll, we'll see if we can sort that out. We'll see what we can do. hundred percent. I think the biggest thing that held me back from leaving the tech space and building a tech company was knowing how difficult it was. So I wasn't an engineer, <laughs> but I was a, I was a, a product manager. So a product owner, and I had a team of 20 engineers. We were building a trading platform, so picture Robinhood uh, equivalent. Um, and I ran the entire team, the entire trading product, uh, trade execution, all the back end, all the boring shit, all the trade flows, right down to the execution broker. And it was so complicated. It was so, so difficult. Now, honest to God, I can't, I can't express to you how hard it was, right? Because I wasn't technical. I was learning it, right? Um, because I was not a technical like uh, technical product manager, so therefore when I was leaving it, everyone was like, "Oh, we'll raise you, we'll get your capital, we'll talk you to this VC and stuff." And I was like, "No, no, 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 not in the beginning. I want a cash flow business first, and then I'll either self fund or do something that that I want to myself, right?" But I, I felt like that could, not a limiting belief, but I think seeing beneath the no, surface. No, but you knew too much. Yeah, to, to some degree, right? Whereas now I see people on, on like Twitter, right? They're like, oh, build a SaaS company and just sell it for a thousand X. I'm like, trust me, I've built product. It's <laughs> fucking hard, man. It's real it's, hard. Obviously, it's yeah. incredibly scalable, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But I'm saying- But like, it's, it's very hard to get it right, yeah. Design, like UX, UI, like, like all those nuances, right? I kind of burnt me a small bit, but now I obviously like I- Oh. And, and getting customers to, and getting customers to pay for it. Hundred um, percent. So yeah, no, it's 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 very hard. But here's the thing: someone up above you in your business who appointed you to do that, someone didn't know at all about how hard it was, and just went, "Hey, yeah, let's do it." Right. Hundred percent. And if they knew how hard it was, they would never have said. And now they've got this asset in their business that you built, um, and uh, and they're <laughs> probably still taking credit for. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. You made you mentioned something very interesting there, but uh, paid users. So I met Roy Samuel. With definitely, guy you should consider. Or should meet. He's from London as well. He sold two companies. He's one company that does uh, a visualization analytics for founders. In the beginning, they do all their financing and dashboard. Super interesting dude. He he said that now at this point that no VC he spoke to gives a shit about free users. They only care about paid users. So they just Tied. they just chopped everyone's feet underneath. They're like, we're, we're not we're not looking at free users anymore. And bear in mind, the the platforms that I worked for had twenty million free users, right? So that just gives you some context in terms of like where it was in 2017, 2018, 2019, and oh, where it yeah, is in yeah. twenty twenty three, yeah. even twenty twenty one, even even twenty twenty one was a high point. But um, no, things things absolutely uh, have shifted. You've got to you've got to really show that you've got a profitable model. Mm, interesting, very interesting. You say rough roads and smooth, and smooth roads and rough. Why is that? Well, if ever you see someone who's on a smooth road, uh, that smooth road mm. definitely started out bumpy. Um, so, you know, if you see someone who is effortlessly up on a stage giving amazing talks and you go, wow, that person's just so good. I guarantee you they've done hundreds of talks and a lot of them were crappy and a lot of them were, you know, traveling three hours to go and talk in front of 12 people and mm. then traveling three hours back and all that sort of stuff. And eventually you become so damn good at what you do that you end up in, in front of the big audiences. So, you know, the smooth road started bumpy. And this, uh, and if people choose a smooth road to begin with, um, it normally ends rough. So a smooth road is typically trying to avoid things that are hard, avoiding things that are difficult. Um, and if it was easy, everyone would be doing it and it would cease to be valuable. Mm -hmm. So I'm extremely suspicious, extremely suspicious of anything that seems like it's easy because my, my default assumption is if it was easy, everyone would do it and it would cease to be valuable. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if it's fucking hard, but it's going to be valuable if if you can push through the insanity of it, if you can push through the tediousness of it, then like, for for example, writing a book and giving away a thousand copies for free is very hard hmm. because you have to write a book knowing you're not going to get paid for it. And you have to do all of that work without being paid. And then you've got to go through the whole publishing process without being paid. 
And then you've got to print up thousands of books and warehouse them. And then you've got to figure out how to give those books to thousands to a thousand plus people in a meaningful way so that they value it. And then you've got to hope that one or two of those (laughs) readers turn into a, a client after all of that work that you've done to begin with. So that is a great example of a really rough road that ends smooth. Mm -hmm. Um, As opposed to if you said, actually, what I'd rather do is I'd much rather just simply, you know, get a nice cushy job for a government organization and, you know, okay, great, but wait until they make your role redundant and then you find yourself at 46 years old uh, on the scrap heap yeah. and it's like, oh, okay. You know, that's, that, that's a smooth road that ends bumpy. Um, I heard you mention, I laughed so much when you said about the guy reading fiction on the tube. Um, and you were like, what? <laughs> because like, you know, I have on, honestly, I can honestly say that, I, that I have not taken a day off in three years. I can honestly say that now some roads, some days are longer and shorter, whatever, but, but, but I, but I just, I just love the game though. That's the difference, right? It's that on a Saturday morning, yes. I like reading my newsletter. On a Sunday morning, I like doing cold outreach because no one's up, right? Small things like yep. this, right? But I just kind of like like the game. Whereas I know people who spend two days on the golf course at the weekend or watch the football, or the rugby. And if they ask me about it, I'm like, dude, like <laughs> we're, on a, we're on a different planet. <laughs> and different it's... planet? Why would I be sitting around watching 23-year-olds earning millions when I could be a, <laughs> earning millions myself? I've never understood that. I just don't understand it. I mean, sure enough, go out and go out and do sport because that actually helps you with your own fitness and your own all of this. But just sitting around watching some other young guys making money, it's like it's insanity to me. <laughs> it's crazy. It's actually it, and it's funny because when I left that, I used to play um, almost semi-professional rugby. And um, so I was very much in that. And then I left it when I had like a very bad injury. I was quite young. Uh, so that's how we kind of got onto this like devotion towards building right um before we finish up i want to ask you about some of like your biggest losses so like you've built some crazy businesses and you've done some awesome stuff but what were some of the biggest like losses or or failures you've had along the way i've had some really tough times um i got into business with a very like a good friend a best friend um in the early days and when he got married everything the whole dynamic completely shifted um, and went from a really fruitful partnership that just worked to like trying to walk through wet cement. It was just, we just couldn't make it work. And, and it went from both of us being focused at how do we make this business profitable and successful to the two of them focused on how do we extract as much out of this business as possible? How do we take the longer holidays? How do we Mm -hmm. take more money out of the business, even if it's losing money? Um, and it became so toxic that I had to do whatever it took to get them out of the business. Um, and what that ended up doing is putting me in debt for five years while having little kids. Um, and I ended up having to pay off a massive debt in full with interest just to buy out someone who had added no value for the previous few years up until that point. So it was like a three year period of trying to make the partnership work. Mm-hmm followed by five years of paying for that person to get out of the business because I didn't have a good shareholders agreement to just get them out on bad lever clause. So, um, and it was around the time of like having little kids and not sleeping and all this sort of stuff. Every single month, thousands and thousands and thousands of productive cash flow, rather than it going back into the business, it goes off to servicing a, a debt for a completely useless purpose. Mm. Um, and that was, I mean, that comes to mind. That is one of my worst mistakes, getting in business with a friend, um, cutting him so much slack to be in the business, giving him equity, no contracts, no agreements, and just simply assuming that the chemistry wouldn't change after after he got married to someone um, and, yeah, I mean, that was, that was literally, that was, that was one of the hardest times of my life and it went on for year after year after year after year after year. Fuck man, what's what's a lesson in there? Like what's what's the next step, right? <clears throat> well, the lesson is business is business and friendship is friendship. Um so you know, if you want to preserve the friendship, put put good solid business agreements in place. Have a shareholders agreement that that says if you need to leave the business, 
for better or worse, and the job's not done, then you get severance of one year's pay or you get severance of, you know, you, you sell back your shares at a basic rate so that we can bring someone else in to do the job that you were paid to do, that you were meant to do, to do the thing that was your job. Um, because obviously if you can't do it, someone else has to do it. And if the, if the, it's almost like if you're, if you're building a building and you're, you've hired a, um, a roofer to put the roof on, it's like, well, the clause is if for whatever reason you can't stick the roof on, you don't get the value of the house. Mm -hmm. You get, you get to, you get to leave, but we need, we need the budget to bring in someone who can put the roof on. Um, so there's one lesson. The other lesson is you have no idea who your best friend's going to marry. Mm. Right. Uh, and if they marry someone who really is very self-interested and does not want to play the, like, it's very easy for two best friends to play the game called one for all, all for one band of brothers, uh, you know, rebels and misfits. We, we work hard, we play hard, we get stuff done. We don't keep score. We don't keep track of, you know, mm. the little things. We just, we just work together. But add a spouse in there who says, no, 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 no. All I care about is I want eight weeks worth of holidays in a really five-star VIP kind of experience. I want to, I want, I want, I want, I want. I want a bigger house. I want a better car. I want a this. Um, and who just basically sits there hassling them for how does this business give me what I want? Mm. If you've got that, if you're up against that, you're not going to win. You know, the person who is going to win is the person they're sleeping in the same bed as. So ultimately, um, ultimately there is a big lesson with young guys and your friends that you, your friends are your friends while they're single. Hmm. That's very and good. They're, and they're very different after they're not. That's a very good lesson to, to, to finish up on. I'm at that age. I'm at, <laughs> I'm at that age of 27. Now where people are kind of breaking off into their different uh, divisions, I guess you put it that way. So I, I see this yeah. more and more often. But Daniel, this was an amazing conversation. I really want to say a massive thank you. I would love to do it in person next time. There's many different elements to get into too. And I feel like another book is coming from you anyway at, at some stage. So we can do it for the next book. But I want to say a massive thank you though. I really de I deeply mean it. And um, anything I can ever do for you, like they really extend my, my help. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been great fun.